I don't know if to say good morning or good afternoon, it's just at 12 o'clock. I'm Jim Harron, I'm Hannah's grandfather, and it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome you all here today, family and friends, whether from near or far, you're most welcome indeed. We've got the, the groom and best man, groomsman, and the ushers at the front, so thank you very much indeed for all your help. We'll begin in just a moment or two, but 
I've been asked to make one or two announcements on behalf of the Terence. Uh, that is, although I'm not wearing a mask at the moment, I will be later, but to ask you to observe social distancing and wear masks as far as possible, just to be careful for your own well-being and the well-being of others. And secondly, to ask, please, not to take any flash photographs during the actual marriage ceremony, as this can be distracting, but you're very welcome to take all that you want uh, as the bridal party leaves the church and, and later on. So, uh, with those few announcements, I'd ask you to be upstanding for the arrival of the bride and her father. <clears throat> Welcome Hannah, Terence, Emma, Catherine, Sarah, and Ruth. We're now complete and about to begin, but we pause for a moment and just have a little prayer. Let us pray. The Bible says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. So Heavenly Father, we pray just now that through the help of your Holy Spirit, we may draw near to you and you to us, and enable us to worship you this day with joy and thanksgiving through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Amen. And we begin that worship with the hymn, Bless the Lord, O my soul. I'd like to thank uh, Jim for welcoming you all into church and setting the scene for our service today. Uh, it's a real honor and privilege for me to stand at the front of the church uh, before Hannah and Aaron and to lead them as they prepare to marry one another. Uh, this is the first time I've done this. Uh, I'm anticipating and hoping that I'll have to do it another two times. Uh, so this isn't a dummy run, this is the real thing. And as we gather together as friends and family, uh, it's great that you're here. I know others are watching from the rotunda and others online watching through the live link because many people can't fit into the church whom 
Aaron and Hannah would have liked to be here. But we welcome you wherever you are and whatever way you're watching this service. Standing here in front of you both, my goodness, uh, Hannah, I know I'm totally biased, obviously, but just beautiful, as are all the other bridesmaids and matron of honor and all those things as well, but just beautiful uh, because you're my daughter. And I think Hannah would look beautiful anyway, even if she was in a bin bag, um, but she's beautifully dressed today and delighted and thrilled and privileged, honored to have brought you up the aisle. And look at Aaron as well. You know, sometimes Aaron turns up at our house, um, maybe after having played rugby or out running, and he's just a sweaty, smelly specimen. Uh, but hasn't his mummy cleaned him up well for today? Uh, he's just looking super, super handsome like myself. Uh, so I know both of you want to get on with this rather than me blethering on. So the first thing that we're going to do is to go forward to the communion table and to light two wedding candles. The symbolism of this is that at this point in the service, Aaron and Hannah are two single people. Uh, equally, you as their friends and families come from different backgrounds. You gather together on different sides of the church, and symbolically, the wedding candles that we're going to light signify that. So if you want to follow me up here, please. Sarah, do you want to help her skirt or whatever is needed there? frock. Isn't that the word? <laughs> Are you going first? Yeah. Okay. You just pull the trigger. Excellent. And then Aaron. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Excellent. Thank you. And then if you want to turn, and I have my instructions to help lift this, it seems, to go back down the steps. <laughs> there you go. So we gather together with that symbolism of Aaron and Hannah now gathered together, and we follow that with the introduction to the service. We have come together in the presence of God to witness the marriage of Hannah and Aaron and to ask his blessing on them and to share in their joy. Our Lord Jesus Christ was himself a guest at a wedding at Cana of Galilee, and through his Spirit he is with us now. The Scriptures set before us marriage as part of God's creation and the holy mystery in which man and woman become one flesh. It is God's purpose that as husband and wife give themselves to each other in love throughout their lives. They should be united in that love as Christ is united with His church. Marriage was ordained that husband and wife may comfort and help each other, living faithfully together in plenty and in need, in sorrow, and in joy. It is intended that with delight and tenderness they may know each other in love, and through the joy of their bodily union they may strengthen the union of their hearts and lives. It is intended that they may be blessed in the children that they may have, in caring for them, and in bringing them up in accordance with God's will to His praise and glory. In marriage, husband and wife begin a new life together in the community. It is a permanent commitment that all should honor. It must not be undertaken carelessly, lightly, or selfishly, but by God's help, with reverence, responsibility, respect, and the promise to be faithful. This is a way of life created and hallowed by God that Aaron and Hannah are now about to begin. They will each give their consent to the other. They will join hands and exchange solemn vows. And in token of this, they will give and receive rings. And therefore, on this their wedding day, we pray that with them, that they may be strengthened and guided by God, and that they may fulfill His purpose for the whole of their earthly life together. And so let us pray. Almighty God, through your Son, Jesus Christ, you send the Holy Spirit to be the life and light of all your people. Open the hearts of these, your servants, to the riches of his grace, that they may bring forth the fruit of the Spirit in love and joy and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 
We're now going to have two Scripture passages read for us. They're fairly familiar passages of Scripture. The first from Ecclesiastes chapter 4, which Stuart McMeekin is going to come to read for us. Thank you, Stuart. The reading is taken from Ecclesiastes chapter 4, beginning at verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Thank you, Stuart. And now to read a passage from Ephesians chapter 3 is Paul Harrell. Thank you, Paul. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Paul. I think we're all completely sweltered. Uh, you look very hot, Aaron, in that gear. Uh, not half as hot as I feel in all this garb. Uh, wish I had left half of it off. But we are here and we're gathered for this wonderful occasion of celebration, uh, something to be thankful for. I'm going to start off by thinking about those two passages of Scripture that you chose because I know you've put a lot of thought into it. As Christians, the Scripture is your guide and you've chosen these passages for us. We are made for relationship. That's the way God has designed us. And in our journey through life, we have lots of relationships. Uh, we have relationships with parents, with siblings, with friends. But this particular passage mentions about the benefit of sort of close, intimate friendship. And that's what you've enjoyed to this point. Uh, and it's a friendship which has developed into love and a love that has developed to the point where you want to commit your lives to each other. And so those words in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 uh, are wonderful words because they speak so much truth, the one helping the other, and therefore that combined effort being better than just making our own journey through life. Marriage is not for everyone, but where God grants that blessing of married life, it's the most wonderful uh, experience that you are about to enter into and to experience the fullness of what that uh, passage means. However, as you work to the bottom of the passage, there's a line that um, reads as follows. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Now, neither of you probably is old enough to remember that awful interview of Princess Diana. And during that interview, the famous interview on television, she said there were three parties in their marriage. So it was really doomed to failure from the start because what you're going to be committing to and what marriage is about is faithfulness of a husband to a wife and a wife to a husband. But actually the scriptures here speak of three people being involved, but before you get a bit upset, uh, you know what that third person is? The third person is God himself. And where there are two gathered together, the scripture makes it clear that that's for the mutual benefit, one of the other, and you're blessed in that relationship. But actually in marriage, where there is that third part, per party, as long as that party is God, then you're even more blessed. 
because just like a cord that it says is twisted together, your lives twisted in with Christ and His with yours, binding you together and enriching even that two-ness that becomes one and Him with you. So the three in Scripture are so important and I'm delighted you've chosen that passage with the three-stranded cord that is not quickly broken. It speaks of the wonderful love of God where He wants to be involved with you. And that leads to the second passage from Ephesians, because here the Apostle Paul is full of enthusiasm in writing to the church and reminding them that people, regardless of background, are loved deeply by God. He desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. In his day, it was thought that was only for Jews, but Paul was saying, no, it's for Gentiles, it's for all people. In our gathering here, it's not just for Hannah from Siegel, it's from Aaron from Eski as well, not too far apart, but from different places. Doesn't matter the color of our skin, our background, anything. God simply loves us and wants us to be saved. And so Paul prays for those who are members of the church, and that includes both of you. And he prays that you will have the power of the Holy Spirit within you so that Christ will dwell in your hearts by faith. Now, I know both of you are Christians, um, and that's wonderful. I had the unique privilege, well, wasn't quite unique, a very special privilege when Hannah was just a wee girl uh, of helping her to give her life to the Lord. Sarah followed her and Ruth followed that, uh, and it's the most wonderful blessing any father can have to lead his children to trust in Christ, and that's what you have done. Aaron, I don't exactly know your Christian background. I probably should have asked, but I know there was a significant event one time at New Horizon. I'm not sure if that was a first commitment or a recommitment, but I have no doubt you're a Christian, as I've no doubt that Hannah's a Christian, because it, the Lord just radiates from you. So as two Christian people, Paul is praying here for you, and we all pray for you as well, that Christ will dwell in your hearts by faith. It's not what we have done. It's simply trusting what Christ has done for us. And you know the gospel, and you trust in Christ, and that's wonderful in your married life together. You have a new house, and you have a new garden, and you planted a tree in the back garden, and understand the tree has died. Uh, I don't know who planted it. Yes, Aaron looks a wee bit guilty there. The tree was planted, but the roots weren't very well established, and that's not what the Christian faith is to be. You know, it's wonderful when you make a commitment when you're young, but that's only the beginning. You then have to put down roots, and you have to become established in the faith. And I know both of you have done that. It's not just a sort of fleeting thing that passed away overnight, but your roots have gone down deep into Christ and trusting in Him, and you are rooted and established in His love. Paul says as a result of that, he wants you to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. You've grown in your relationship with Jesus. You know more about his love now than you did when you were a child, Hannah, making that commitment, and Aaron, when you first made your commitment. That's the work of the Holy Spirit within us, helping us to experience and to know more of God's love for us. It's a process that is never to stop, because Paul says that he wants us to grasp that love of Christ, but also to know the love that surpasses knowledge. He wants you to be overwhelmed. Elsewhere in chapter 5, verse 18, he says that we're to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The tense is to go on being filled. Daily, we need to trust Christ, to seek the fullness of the Holy Spirit, because then the wonderful promise at the end of this verse becomes true, and that's what we want for you as individuals and in your marriage. Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. It's exciting when someone becomes a Christian. It's exciting when Christians marry because it's a new beginning, and only God knows what lies ahead, what way he's going to bless you. But as you go down deep into him, those promises are there. It's such an exciting journey as the Christian faith, but also your marriage. And not knowing what lies into the future, there will be 
difficulties inevitably, but there will be those wonderful good times, and that's what we long for for you. Do you know, the love of Christ for us is a costly thing. Um, it cost him his life on the cross to save us, and love within marriage is costly as well. I'll not be asking you, do you love each other? Just look at each other a moment. You see, that shows it. There are those feelings of love, and you shouldn't be here today if you haven't got those feelings of love. But love in marriage is not about feelings. It's about a commitment. When Jesus gave his life on the cross for us, it didn't feel good. It was horrendous. It was a big sacrifice. And sometimes in love, that's what we're called to, simply to put the other person's needs before our own. Now, Aaron, I know that for some weird reason you like rugby and football and dear knows what other sort of sport. Well, actually, there will be times when you'll have to forsake that and I'll be delighted um, because Hannah will want to do something else and it'll actually be in her best interest to help her to develop and become the full woman that she can be for you to lay some of that aside. And Hannah, there might be those times when you want to go shopping and all of those things that women seem to enjoy. And it might be time to say, well, actually, no, because there's something more important where I need to support Aaron and to be there with him. Those might seem minor things, but actually in marriage, it's constantly thinking not of self, but of the other person. And what can I do to enable them to become the person that God wants them to be? Not the person I want them to be, but the person that God wants them to be. Now to us as human beings, that seems ridiculous because we're in a me-centered world. It's all about me and what I can get. But actually, because we are made by God for relationship with Him and for others, His ways are very different. It seems bizarre that when you put your husband or your wife before yourself, that actually that leads to the best marriage. And it leads to you being fulfilled as well as the other person developing in their faith. So there is a cost but it's a cost that brings blessing. Just as Christ's cost on the cross brought blessing to us, so for you as well. Do you know, actually, husbands have a really hard task because further on in Ephesians, Paul speaks to wives, and he says, wives, submit to your husband as to the Lord. Now, sometimes that isn't a popular thought nowadays, nor is the words that we will be saying in the service where you promise to obey. And people sometimes think, I'm not doing any of that. That's an old-fashioned thing. Well, actually, it's good that it's old-fashioned because it's biblical, and we want to be biblical. But that submission comes at a greater cost to the husband because he is called to love his wife in the way that Christ loves the church, and that's a big calling, and you will fail. Where is Alison? Haven't I failed, dear? Yes, many times I have let Alison down by not loving her in the way that Christ loves the church. And you, Aaron, at times will let Hannah down in the same way. But as you work as a couple, it's not that there's a dominant one and a submissive one. You're in partnership. But under God, his design is that Aaron, as the head of the household, is to love you, Hannah, wholeheartedly. And when he attempts to love you as the Lord loves you, you find that actually that obedience comes easily in the same way you obey the Lord because you know that he would never ask anything of you that crushes you, but rather that helps you to develop and to become the full person that God wants you to be. So it's a wonderful way of life uh, that you're about to enter into. Another verse in Scripture says, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. And that's really important. Don't think it's giving anything away that both of you have a wee bit of a temper and sometimes can hold grudges and things like that. Um, I have experienced that as well. And sometimes when your mother and I have a dispute, we don't always do what the Bible says. And there are times when we've gone to bed and we haven't got the thing sorted out. And I tend to look at one wall and she looks at the other wall. And it's not a happy place to be. And in the morning when we wake up, it's usually worse. Um, because then you're thinking, I'm not going to talk to her until she talks to me. And she's thinking, I'm not going to talk to him until he says sorry to me. Because no matter what you do, 
the man usually is the one that has to say sorry. So you may get used to that. You know that already, don't you? Yep. And so it continues. But a better way to resolve things is the biblical way, not to let the sun go down on your wrath. And again, that's hard. But it's what the Bible says. And actually, when you do it, when you try to get that issue resolved before going to bed, then again, the Lord is in that and he helps you through it. And in the morning, instead of thinking, you look across, and you might look across at Aaron, and you'll see him lying there on the pillow with his mouth open and a big slabber down into the pillow. And you might look at him and think, why have I married him? And you'll remember because God brought him into your life. And at that moment, you look at him and say, do you know, I love you. And I'm going to make that decision to love you no matter what. So Aaron, as the head of your new household, I'm going to give you this copy of the Bible. I know you have Bibles already, uh, but this is the traditional thing for a minister to do. Um, and it's not just a book to get dusty. I remember, as probably both of you did when you were in school, being given a Gideon Bible, and it's red. And I remember to this day, the man who gave it out said, it's red on the outside, so it should be red on the inside. And I know it's your discipline to read the scripture each day as individuals, but maybe to look at it and think, well, what does it say about my life? What does it say about our married life together? And then to seek the wisdom of God to live by it. I'm sure you've written we love letters to each other. No, <laughs> texts. Yeah, <laughs> reluctantly I got that out of him. Okay, there are those wee messages that simply say, I love you. The girls keep me going because when I text them, at the bottom of it always put, love daddy, XXX. And that's something just, it's that wee statement to remind them that they're loved and that they're precious. The scripture is like a love letter from God. It's a much more important love letter than you write to each other. And so read it, mark it, learn it, and inwardly digest it. That's good Anglican teaching. I know you sort of were in the free pee for a wee while there, Aaron, and now you've come back into your roots in the Church of Ireland, which uh, we're delighted about. It doesn't matter what church you're in. The Lord bless both of you. Use the Scripture as your guide, and above all, as those passages say, remember how much you're loved by God. And we'll all be praying for you and asking God's blessing upon you. Is that enough? I'm not meant to be speaking very much after my um, surgery, and I've probably overdone it. So we'll get on now, and we'll get you married. So do you want to hand that Bible over out of the way there? So first of all, we determine if you're free to marry. Aaron and Hannah, the vows that you are about to take are to be made in the name of God, who is judge of all and knows all the secrets of our hearts. And therefore, if either of you knows any reason why you may not lawfully marry, you must declare it now. Thank the Lord for that. <laughs> After all the preparation, it would be a bit of a hiccup. So you can marry when I need to work out if you want to marry. Aaron, will you take Hannah to be your wife? Will you love her, comfort her, honor and care for her? And forsaking all others, be faithful to her as long as you both shall live. Good man. Hannah, will you take Aaron to be your husband? Will you love him, comfort him, honor and care for him? And forsaking all others, be faithful to him as long as you both shall live. Amen. Who gives this woman to be married to this man? I do. Okay, so I'll take your hand, allowed to touch your hand because we're one bubble household, and give it across to Aaron. And if you want to turn to face each other, and just let go of your hands there. And if the congregation would like to stand to witness the marriage vows. Those of you who know Hannah and Aaron will know that they're not terribly demonstrative. So it gives me great pleasure to command Aaron to reach out his hand and take Hannah's right hand and then to say these vows after me. I, Aaron Samuel, Take you, Hannah Daisy Joy, to be my wife. To have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, 
in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death us do part, according to God's holy law. This is my solemn vow. If you want to let go of each other's hands, and then Hannah likewise, reach out and take Aaron's, and say after me, I, Hannah Daisy Joy, take you, Aaron Samuel, to be my husband. To have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love, cherish, and obey, till death us do part, according to God's holy law. This is my solemn vow. Have we got two rings? There's a wee hole in the floor there, and there's a bit of paper over it, so you should be okay. Thank you. And so, Heavenly Father, may these rings be to Hannah and Aaron, symbols of unending love and faithfulness, to remind them of the vow and covenant which they have made this day. Aaron, if you take the delicate ring and place it on Hannah's right ring finger. And then if you repeat after me, Hannah, I give you this ring as a sign of our marriage. With my body, I honor you. And all that I have, I share with you. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then Hannah, the massive ring. Aaron, I give you this ring as a sign of our marriage. With my body, I honor you. And all that I have, I share with you. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you both want to turn to face me. In the presence of God and before this congregation, Aaron and Hannah have given their consent and made their marriage vows to each other. They have declared their marriage by the joining of hands and by the giving and receiving of rings. And therefore, in the name of God, I pronounce that they are husband and wife. And so what God has joined together, let no one put asunder. The congregation remains standing for prayer. Let us pray. So Aaron and Hannah, may God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit bless, preserve, and keep you. The Lord mercifully grant you the riches of his grace that you may live together in faith and love and receive the blessing of eternal life. Amen. And I offer you this prayer to pray together as your first action as husband and wife. Well done. Thank you. Would you like to stand, please? I mentioned at the start of the service that Aaron and Hannah were lighting two candles that represent them as two individuals. Often in the service now, we extinguish those candles and light one central candle that represents them as husband and wife. But in the light of the passages that were chosen, we're going to do something different, and that is to leave the two candles lit and then to light that larger central candle to symbolize Christ at the center of your marriage, intertwining you and drawing you deeper into him. So if you want to come forward with me and light your marriage candle.
you can do that together if there's some way you can manage it. Excellent. Okay. Hannah and Aaron are going to seal their marriage by receiving Holy Communion, and we invite you as the congregation to be seated. And if both of you want to go back out there, and we'll close the rail. In the Church of Ireland prayer of thanksgiving at Holy Communion, there are responses. Um, today, I'm just going to say those responses on behalf of everyone in the church, and particularly on behalf of Aaron and Hannah. The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Father Almighty and ever-living God, at all times and in all places, it is right to give you thanks and praise. We give you thanks because you have made the union between Christ and His church a pattern for marriage between husband and wife. And so with all your people, with the angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, Father, the creator and sustainer of all things. You made us in your own image. Male and female, you created us. And even when we turned away from you, you never ceased to care for us. But in your love and mercy, you freed us from slavery of sin, giving your only begotten Son to become man and suffer death on the cross to redeem us. He made there the one complete and all-sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. He instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. On the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks to you, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And therefore, Father, with this bread and this cup, we do as Christ your Son commanded. We remember his passion and death. We celebrate his resurrection and ascension. And we look for the coming of his kingdom. Accept through him, our great high priest, this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts, Grant by the power of the life-giving Spirit that we may be made one in your holy church and partakers of the body and blood of your Son, that he may dwell in us and we in him. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. And so draw near with faith and receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Remember that he died for you, and feed in him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. And of the body of Christ, keep you in eternal life. And the body of Christ, keep you in eternal life. And 
the blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. Nor in the blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. If you'd like to turn and go back to face the people. If you want to just look down at the people, uh, it's great that we've come to this point. We've now got them married. They are husband and wife together. And again, I have great pleasure in commanding Aaron. Aaron, kiss your wife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And the important thing in marriage is keep on kissing her. Uh, don't give up on it. Uh, keep working on that and keep that love alive. Now, as a congregation, we have witnessed them becoming husband and wife together. We have even seen them kiss, which is a rare thing. Uh, have we ever seen them kiss? I don't think so, no. They're very private. They give off to Alison and I for doing that sort of thing. Uh, but we're going to encourage them in it further. So turn back round to your family and friends. And if everyone could stand up, please. And if you turn in your order of service to the middle section, there's a very important um, question that I'm going to ask you. It comes under the heading Affirmation by the People. You can read it there. I'm going to ask you, as their family and friends, whether you will encourage and support them in their marriage. Now, we don't want a wee look warm thing. We want a proper bit of volume and a cheer and a clap or whatever you want to do. So are you ready on your marks? Okay, will you, the family and friends of Hannah and Aaron, support and encourage them in their marriage? We will. Excellent, a round of applause for them. I think just because I've never seen it before, I'm going to make him kiss her again. <laughs> kiss. <laughs> See, he's a man under authority. Under, I can get him to do what I want now. Okay, good man. So, uh, good snogger there. So, keep that going. <laughs> And seeing them now as husband and wife and enjoying that wonderful love that God has created between them and that has to be celebrated and encouraged, we're now going to turn and pray for them. So the next section is called the acclamations, and you'll see that there are responses there to join in with, where we bless God. Blessed are you, Heavenly Father. You give joy to the bridegroom and the bride. Blessed are you, Lord Jesus Christ. You have brought new life to all your people. Blessed are you, Holy Spirit of God. You bring us together in love. Blessed be the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God to be praised forever. Amen. I'm going to invite the congregation, please, to sit for prayer and invite Jim back to lead us in our prayers. If you both want to kneel, and Jim will come round you here. Marriage brings together two persons, today Aaron and Hannah, but also two homes or families, today the Abraham and the Cadden homes. And so we begin our prayers with thanksgiving for home and family life. We thank you, God, for the security and happiness of our homes, for the love of parents and children, and for the support of relatives and friends. May the love that unites us grow deeper with passing years and remain unspoiled by selfishness, ingratitude, or pride. May a thoughtful, kind, and generous spirit grow and develop among us, nourished by your love for us and our love for you and our desire to please you in all we say and do through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
continuing to think of family. Today we also remember loved ones who are no longer with us, whether their passing was recent or in past years. We thank you for their love and example, their patience and courage, sometimes through pain and weakness. In Christ, for them, the words of this hymn have been fulfilled. When sufferings cease and sorrows die, and every longing satisfied, then joy unspeakable will flood my soul, for I am truly home. We now pray for Aaron and Hannah. Lord Jesus Christ, who by your presence and power brought joy to the wedding at Cana in Galilee, bless Aaron and Hannah as they have committed their lives to each other today. We thank you for the love that brought them together and has sustained them through friendship and engagement. May their hopes and desires be realized, their love deepen and grow, and may shared tasks, trials, and joys bind them ever closer to you and to each other. May their home be a place of warmth and welcome, built upon the strong foundation of love for you and each other. And may they always know your presence, joy, and peace with them. Amen. Amen. And now may the grace of God the Father, the grace of God the Son, and the grace of the Holy Spirit, blessed three in one, be with us now and always. Amen. Amen. And we draw our prayers towards a conclusion by joining together in the Lord's Prayer on our service order. Our Father, our, our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Jim. It's great that we have people who have traveled across from England to be with us today and also from Scotland. I'm not sure if people have traveled from anywhere else. Is that right? Just those two places and they joined with us. One from France. Oh, excellent. Trey, welcome, whatever you were meant to say. I'm no French scholar, but it's great that you're here. Uh, so we're people from different nations, but Irish hymns are wonderful. And hopefully those of you who are not Irish will get the beat of this amazing ancient Irish hymn, Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart. It links in so clearly with the three-stranded chord and having our vision fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Be thou my vision. Please stand to sing.
congregation would like to be seated, please. We're going to have the signing of the marriage register. And while that is taking place, we're going to listen to two pieces of music being sung. The first of those composed by Alison and sung by Ruth is uh, linking in again with the reading for today, a chord of three strands, and that will be followed by the blessing, which Matthew and Ruth will sing together. strands is not quickly broken a cord of three strands is not quickly broken the father the son the spirit of and you strands is not quickly broken with God at your head go forth Thank you. 
The congregation would like to stand, please, for the final blessing. My God, the Holy Trinity, make you strong in faith and love, defend you on every side, and guide you in truth and peace. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. If you'd like to be seated, please, for a moment. At the end of this service, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Aaron Abram uh, will lead the bridal party out through the tower door. Uh, everyone else, if you can remain um, in your pews at that point, and then leave the people in the body of the church through this door, the people in the wing through the back door there, uh, trying to maintain social distancing as you go and in the parish centre adjoining. Everyone is then invited to afternoon tea. Uh, again, if you please would wear masks throughout in the building. If you haven't got your mask on at the moment uh, and you're not exempt, please put it on so that as you go out through the building, uh, we're all kept as safe as possible. When you're having your afternoon tea, you can take it off uh, while you're eating, but please put it on again if you need to get up to walk about. There's also a pizza van uh, outside for those who want pizza pizza, and there's an ice cream machine in the parish centre for those who want to pretend they're in Port Stewart and are getting a poke. Uh, any English or uh, Scottish people who don't know what a poke is, ask and you'll soon be advised what it is, but please do join and enjoy those refreshments. And so I ask you now please to be upstanding as we invite Mr. and Mrs. Abraham to walk down through us. Oh, uh -huh. 
Stripping up so strong. 